Prabhuji, please accept our humble obeisance. All glories to Prabhupada. Hare Krishna, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All right. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Nice to have your association. In this class. Hare Krishna and Dr. Namaraj. So, uh, we're, we're just having a storm here in, in uh, Mayapur to just now, just five minutes ago. A big storm, <laughs> thunder, and heavy rain. So, I don't know how the internet will be, but anyway. We'll have a go and hopefully we can continue. Okay, so. Hare, Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, this is Logistic Krishna Das, the course coordinator, Dhanavad Pranam Maharaj. So, before we begin, as is the. Um, we have in Mayapur Institute, we, we wish to introduce Maharaj. So, we have Duti Gopi Mataji, who is our class representative, who will be introducing Maharaj. Yes, Mataji, you can go ahead. Hi, Krishna Maharaj. Hi, Krishna Devotee. So, we welcome you all uh, to this Bhakti Vaiva course, and it is our utmost fortune that we have His Honor's Bhakti Vigna Vinasana since Swami Maharaj who will be taking the first unit of our course. So, Maharaj was initiated by Srila Prabhupada in London in 1971. A year later, he received second initiation. He has been preaching for the last 20 years in Asian countries such as India, Philippines, China, and Thailand. Through his years of preaching, he has given countless souls practical guidance and deep inspiration. Taking sannyas in Mayapur in 1994 from Tamil Krishna Maharaj did not mean much of a change in his lifestyle since Maharaj has always been very strict in his sadhana. Whoever gets to know Maharaj admires and respects his sincere and faithful practice of chanting the holy name of the Lord. He truly walks his talk. Maharaj has been teaching with Mayapur Institute since its inception. So we welcome Maharaj uh, by chanting of Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Hare Hare. Okay, thank you very much for your welcome. Actually, that resume, that's, that must have been written 20 years ago, I think. <laughs> it's quite out of date. Anyway, uh, okay, so I'll, I'll begin by offering some prayers myself. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksur Militan Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shremati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatari Vanchakaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bayevacha Patita Namakavane Bio Vaishnavibio Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadha Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhaktavinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare is everyone able to see the slide, the PowerPoint presentation? Yes, yes Maharaj. Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. All right, so this Unit 1, Lesson 1, Introduction to Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. So the first chapter, which we hope we're going to... Well, we're not going to go through it all today because... There's a lot there in the first three verses, but anyway, we'll, we'll have an overview. Huh. A lot of music going on. We'll have an overview 
of the first chapter here. It begins with the invocation in the form of three verses, like the prelude to the Bhagavatam. The first verse is a definition of the first verse is a definition of the absolute truth. Uh, could we do something about muting these uh, sounds every time? People coming in? I don't think we need to have that music every time somebody... You know, there's going to be people coming in, joining late. We don't want to have that sound going all the time. Can you move? Yes, Maharaj, I'll try to fix it. Uh, let, let me try to fix it. All right, so the first verse, the subject of the Srimad Bhagavatam, actually it's a definition of the absolute truth. And we should point out that Srila Prabhupada's preface to the Srimad Bhagavatam is also very interesting. I hope you've all had a look at the preface of the, Bhagav of the Bhagavatam. Because in the preface, Prabhupada brings out an important point. He explains how the concept of the Absolute Truth is far above the concept of God. In religion or in uh, Hinduism, for example, we will see there's many gods. And generally, we think of God as the controller. But the concept of the Absolute Truth is much greater. The, the Absolute Truth defines that which pers that person who is the source of all energies. So this is brought out in the definition of the Absolute Truth in the first verse, that the, the Absolute Truth is personal. So the first verse of the Srimad Bhagavatam is very important and quoted and we should know, we should know it well, we should be familiar with the different sections of the first verse and we will look at it today. And then the second verse of the Bhagavatam, of the first chapter, goes on to describe the glories of devotional service and then explains what is actual religion, the De definition of actual religion is given. And then with the third verse of Srimad Bhagavatam, we will hear about the actual sweetness of devotional service, how we can develop a real taste for serving the Lord through hearing and chanting Srimad Bhagavatam. So the invocation verses, the first three verses are very interesting and we'll be looking at them in the course of this first unit. And then the chapter goes on, text 4 to text 8, we will hear about, of course the, the scene is introduced Naimisharanya and Sutta Goswami is the speaker. So the Naimisharanya sages have gathered there to perform a 1,000 year sacrifice and Sutta Goswami has been elected as the speaker. So the first chapter, these four first verses, text 4 to 8, will help us to understand what are the particular qualifications of Sutta Goswami? And what we will hear also about the inquiries of the sages. In text 9 to 23, uh, we'll hear the, the six, que six questions of the sages. And these six questions actually perform the subject matter for the entire Srimad Bhagavatam. The elaboration of these six questions provides a, a theme for the whole twelve cantos of the Srimad Bhagavatam. All right, so this is the overview, this is a breakdown of the first chapter. 
We'll go ahead. Okay, so here you can see Sutta Goswami and Shonaka, Shonaka Rishi, the great sage who is the head of the, the sages and who has been nominated to put the questions to Sutta Goswami. And he does a very good job. He's a very powerful speaker himself and he's a very enlightened personality. So where you have such a nice audience headed by Shonaka and such a wonderful speaker as Sutta Goswami, then we can be sure there will be a very wonderful atmosphere generated and the subjects which they talk, their discussions will be very enlightening for everyone. All right, so the, I'll just read it here, the, this fifth verse. One day after finishing their morning duties by burning a sacrificial fire and offering a seat of esteem to Srila Sutta Goswami, the great sages made inquiries with great respect about the following matters. So what we can do to begin with, I would like to hear, you know, we try to make these classes as interactive as possible. So I depend a lot on your participation and I would like to hear from you what are some of the qualifications of Sutta Goswami which are particularly mentioned here by Srila Vyasadeva and also by Srila Prabhupada in his purports. Would, would you, some of the class members, like to tell me what are some of the qualifications? Yes? Yeah, uh, Sri Sutra Goswami uh, is a free form of voice. Another. Sorry? I'm not hearing you clearly. Uh, Sri Goswami uh, is a free form of voice. Voice. Is free from vice. Yes. Yeah. That's a very, a very important point, right. He's, he's, he has, in other words, he, he does not have any bad habits. He's completely free of all vices. Right? What, what do we mean when we speak about vices? Could you tell us? Yeah, the, the four regulative principles that, that are mandated. So if we don't follow, uh, then we have those four vices. Right, yes. So, Srila Prabhupada was very particular about this. He said, anybody who is the representative of Vyasa Dev, who is going to sit on the Vyasa Sana, they must be free from vice. They cannot have, they should not have any sinful habits. They should not be indulging in any kinds of illicit activities. That's very essential in selecting a person to speak on Srimad Bhagavatam and to take a seat of honor like that. It's very important. And of course we can think, we're reminded of the example how Roma Harshan was sitting on the on the Roma Harshan was seated on the Vyasasan. But he did not offer respects to Lord Balaram. And Lord Balaram took that as an offence. He saw the pride that Ramaharshan was guilty of pride. And a person who has pride, who's, who's proud, he should not be sitting on the Vyasasan as a representative of Srila Vyasadeva. That, that, uh, Pride, we could call it a t kind of intoxication. People become proud, they become intoxicated about their own position. And they're not humble. They don't have the humility which a representative of Vyasadeva should actually have. And so Lord Balaram detected this because everyone was offering respect to him 
everyone except Ramaharshan, everyone either stood up or they bowed down or folded their hands, but Ramaharshan just remained seated. Now we may say, but well, actually he's, he was on the Vyasa sign, he was the speaker, he's not required to respect anybody. Well, he's not required to respect ordinary people, but when the personality of Godhead comes, then he is required to offer respects. So this was the problem. And that's why Lord Balaram took the blade of kosha grass and pierced the heart of Ramaharsha. All right, so first quality of a representative of Vyasadev, free from vices, any other qualification required. He was renounced. Renounced. Free from the material desires. All right. Free from material desires. In other words, you could say he has to be a controller of his senses. He cannot just simply be a sense gratifier. He must be in control of his mind and senses. He should actually be a, Gos a Swami. He should be a Swami or a Goswami. He should be properly situated on the transcendental platform. And he should not be the servant of his mind and senses. All right? Yes? So he, he was very, very well versed in the scriptures like Puranas and history and he understood the conclusion of it and which he was totally qualified to explain about it. So probably this was another of his qualities. Yes, he was well read in the scriptures. He studied from qualified people. Of, in those days, of course, this is before before the beginning of Kali Yuga, so there were, no re there were no books. Everything was heard. People would hear and they would remember. So Sutta Goswami, he had heard, as you said, he had heard the scriptures, the Puranas, and the, the, the Vedas, the Itihasas, like that. And Srila Prabhupada also talks that actually the representative of Srila Vyasadeva, he should be learned in all the six different philosophies. There are the Sat Darshans, the six philosophies, six philosophical systems which reveal the absolute truth, right? Do you know the name? Do you know who are the propounders of these different philosophical systems and what, what philosophy did they produce? No, Maharaj. You don't know? Some... Mimamsa is one of the Mimamsa and who propounded, who, who presented the philosophy of Mimamsa? Maharaj, I don't remember. Huh? Maharaj, I am not able to remember that. Really? You never, you never read Govardhan Leela? It was Jaimini Rishi Yes, thank you. Right. Jaimini. Jaimini presented the Karma Mimamsa, the kar philosophy of Karma Mimamsa. Right? Any other philosophical systems? You know, yes? yes? Uh, Sankhya Philosophy, Maharaj. Yes, Sankhya. And who presented that? Astanga Rishi. Uh, Sankhya came uh, from? Uh, uh, Kapila. Kapila Rishi. Yes, Kapila <laughs> Muni. Kapila Muni presented the Sankhya Philosophy. Right. And then? There was Nyaya presented Nyaya. by Gautam. Nyaya. Nyaya or logic. Right? And who presented that? Gautam. Gautam. Yes. Right. And then? Um, there was also Yoga by Patanjali. Yes. 
Patanjali Yoga, the Yoga Sutras from Patanjali. Yes? Any more? There aren't, um, but I don't remember the sort of like when there's the Vedanta. Well, what's our philosophical, what's our philosophical system? Yes. Huh? Yes? What system are we following? Vedanta. Yes, Vedanta. And who, prese who, pre who presented Vedanta? The Vyasadeva. Yes, Srila Vyasadeva, right. Uh-huh, good. Okay, so we've got that. Then there's also, there's one also by Astabakra. Astabakra, he also presented a philosophical system of impersonalism. Like that, these are the, what's called sat, sat darshans, or the six vi ways to view the Absolute Truth. And the most powerful, the most superior of the six philosophies is the Vedanta, teachings of Vedanta from Srila Vyasadeva. All right, so the speaker who is going to sit on the Vyasatan, he should be familiar with these different philosophical systems. Any other points? Should be coming in the disciplic succession? Yes, he, well, he should have studied the scriptures through the disciplic succession. Yes, he should be, should be connected. Uh, his, his studies, his, un teach his, what he's understood, should be received through the disciplic succession. He was submissive? Yes, right. He should be submissive and obedient. In other words, he should be of the highest character. Maharaj, he was the senior most uh, Veda Vedantist among all the sages. Sutta Goswami? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, of course, that's why he's on the seat. That's why he's been elected to speak, because he's the most senior. What was his qualification? What we're saying, the different qualifications of a representative of Vyasadeva. And what about the Sutta Goswami? What was his particular qualification? What did he actually hear? He heard in specific succession Bhagavatam from uh, Shukadeva Goswami and then he was giving to sages of Nemishara. Right, yes, he was there. When Maharaj Parikshit was hearing Srimad Bhagavatam from Sukadeva Goswami, at that time Sutta Goswami was present. He was there among the assembly of sages who had all gathered to hear Sukadeva Goswami speak Srimad Bhagavatam. So he's heard the Srimad Bhagavatam and he's going to repeat what he had heard, what he had understood from these from the talks of Sukadeva Goswami. All right, and then Prabhupada also makes a point about uh, in presenting questions that he should not that he should not put challenging questions, but the questions should have a philosophical basis. They should be reasonable and intelligent questions, they should not be challenging. That's an important point. So this first chapter begins with hearing about the qualification of Sutta Goswami and at the same time we hear a little about the qualification of the audience. We should understand you may have the very best teacher, but if the audience are not qualified, then even you have the very best teacher, the audience won't be able to take advantage. 
That's a problem. So the qualification of the audience, what could you say about the audience? What's their qualification? But I mentioned one, that when they put questions, they should not be challenging. Can you think some other qualifications required for the audience? Um, they must be uh, pre uh, presenting questions that are of well-being of the entire world or human humanity. Yes, okay, the questions should be of value to the world, to, other, to the whole human society. Yes? And should be related to Krishna? Should be relate in relationship to Krishna, yes. They should have faith in the speaker. Yes, they should have some faith in the speaker. He should serve. He should serve the speaker. They should give service to the speaker. Well, their service, what is their service? They should submissively hear from Submissively hear. Yes, right. That's their service, to submissively hear. They must hear with full care and attention. They, must, they should be eager to hear. You know, sometimes you go to school, you know, you're not very eager to hear. <laughs> Difficult job for school teachers when they have to teach children who, who don't want to hear. Uh, one of my, the wife of one of my friends was told by her headmistress, she, the headmistress told her, don't even try to teach them. Don't even try to teach them. They don't want to learn anything. <laughs> so this, the, the school, modern school education is in that kind of condition. So, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, it's a different affair. This is a transcendental affair. And the people who have come to hear Srimad Bhagavatam, they should be eager to hear, and they're hearing with rapt attention. They're hearing submissively. And that makes a very nice atmosphere. Okay? So we're going to go ahead to the next, what, well, here, the next slide from, from text number six. The sage said, respected Sutta Goswami, you are completely free from all vice. You are well versed in all the scriptures, famous for religious life, and in the Puranas and the histories as well, for you have got You've gone through them under proper guidance and have also explained them. All right, so many of these points we brought up. His Sutta Goswami's qualifications are being mentioned. Mm -hmm. Then, being the eldest learned Vedantist, O Sutta Goswami, you are acquainted with the knowledge of Vyasadeva who is the incarnation of Godhead. And you also know other sages who are fully versed in all kinds of physical and metaphysical knowledge. All right, so we're hearing more about the qualifications of Sutta Goswami. He, he was acquainted with the knowledge of Vyasadeva, as we just heard. He heard the Srimad Bhagavatam from Shukadev. And you also know other sages, other sages who are fully, oh, Krishna, oh, Hare Krishna. Other sages who are fully versed in all kinds of physical and metaphysical knowledge. So he had good association, philosophical association. Text number eight. And because you are submissive, your spiritual masters have endowed you with all the favors bestowed upon a gentle disciple. Therefore, you can tell us all that which you have scientifically learned from them. So we see how Sutta Goswami got the mercy he got the blessings from his spiritual superiors because of his good qualities, because of his submissiveness, 
and because of his obedience. We see similar situations in Shastra. Can you think of other people who were also blessed in a similar manner? They were submissive. Maharaj. Yes. Uh, Dhruv Maharaj. Dhruv Maharaj. Palad Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj, Prahlad Maharaj, were, well... Because they were serious, because they were serious in the bhakti of Vishnu, uh, they were blessed by Narad Muni, and then they got the uh, association of Vishnu. Yes, they followed the instructions of their guru. Maharaj Vyas Dev himself who has uh, followed the instructions of uh, Narad Dev. Is his guru. Yes, right. I was thinking of Na the... Marad Narad 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 Muri in his previous life when he was Yes, a right. That, that's the example which comes in my mind. That's the example which came to me that Narada Muni in his previous life, how the the Bhakti Vedantas had come to his home and he was a young boy and he was helping his mother and he took advantage to serve him, to serve the Bhaktivedantas. He served them, he brought their food, he was very obedient and, and serving to them and taking care of them, and they blessed him. They gave their blessings on him. They allowed him to take even the remnants of their food, and they allowed him to listen to their discussions and to watch their activities, to see how they meditated on the Lord and how they worshipped the Lord. So like that, and, and it's important, the relationship between the disciple and the spiritual master, that we should remember we're, we're the servant and he's the master and we should be submissive and we should be obedient and it, willing to carry out whatever instruction the spiritual master gives us. All right. This is a quotation here from Srila Prabhupada from the, a lecture given in London in 1971 on the first canto, first chapter, verses 5 to, to 6. Unless you fully assimilate, understand, you cannot describe it. So two things, simply reading will not help us. When we shall be able to preach, the reading matter. Doesn't matter whether in the same language or in my own language. That is wanted. So Srila Prabhupada is encouraging the devotees to go a little further than simply reading. And a little further than reading is to uh, preach, to hear the subject matter and to discuss it with the devotees. Why do you think Prabhupada is saying reading will not help us? What do you think the problem could be with reading? Hare Krishna Maharaj, so uh, uh, re uh, simply reading without uh, uh, guidance of uh, uh, the learned sages or Guru Maharaj, uh, we will understand only the worldly meaning, but uh, uh, the actual uh, uh, meaning can be only explained by uh, the learned Guru who has understood uh, it completely. Uh-huh. If, you know, sometimes even people may read and it just becomes a reading exercise and we don't actually know what we're reading. If you ask someone after they've read, you know, what did you just read? What did you read, Prabhu? They'll say, oh, I don't know, I don't remember, I don't know what it was about. They, just, they were just reading. I remember when, when I joined the movement, in the very, and that was, as, as you heard, 1971, I became a devotee in London. So in those days, Srimad Bhagavatam, we would just sit together and one person would read. And we'd pass the book around and each of us would take turns to read. 
But I really didn't know what was going on. We were reading from the Bhagavatam. We had Srila Prabhupada's first canto, Srimad Bhagavatam. He had printed it in India. Maybe you've seen these books, the original books, which were first printed in India, and Prabhupada brought them to America. And so there was, a, there was a, a set of those books in London, and we used to use them in the morning for Bhagavatam class, and we would read. Of course, it, the, the books were not perfect. There were many uh, spelling mistakes and editorial editing mistakes, because in those days everything was done by letter press and type press, and, and Prabhupada had done everything alone, practically. Anyway, we were reading those books, and, but it was not easy to understand what was happening, what was taking place. All the devotees were new, really new, like, you know, maybe you know, a few months in the movement. <laughs> and some people, if you were in, in the movement a year, you were really an old devotee. <laughs> so like, but we really didn't have much training in those days. We didn't know very much. So Prabhupada, later after a short time, Prabhupada introduced the Bhagavatam class, that we have to have Bhagavatam classes and take one sloka and discuss it and not just simply read and know nothing, but we, he wanted us to actually understand. One person was expected to speak and then the other devotees were expected to give questions and to inquire or make comments. And in this way, a nice spiritual atmosphere was generated in discussing Srimad Bhagavatam. As we have today, Srimad Bhagavatam classes are very relishable. And we hear some wonderful speakers in our Krishna consciousness movement. It's very wonderful to listen to the lectures of some of the very senior devotees. Their classes are so enlightening. Okay. All right, so the subject matter goes on. After hearing about the qualifications of Sutta Goswami, we're going to hear about the nature of the Kali Yuga, because this Srimad Bhagavatam is being spoken for the benefit of people in the Kali Yuga. So maybe many of you may know this verse, the tenth verse. Right? You can all chant it together. Prayena pao yusha shapya kalova smina yagejana manda sumanda matayo manda bhagya yurupadruta. So this is the tenth verse. The verse is describing the different qualifications of people in the Kali Yuga. And it's not really a glorification. <laughs> Rather, it's telling about all of our problems and all of our faults which we have in the Kali Yuga. Right? The first, first one here mentioned, Alpa Ayusha. Alpa Ayusha, meaning overeating, over sense gratification, over-dependence on another's mercy and artificial standards of living. And these things sap the very vitality of human energy. Therefore, the duration of life is shortened. Alpa Ayusha, short life. People, of course, want to have a long life. We don't like a short life. We, we, many people, they, they like to have a long life. Nobody wants to die even. And so, Srimad Bhagavatam directs us to see the faults in the modern way of life. Overeating, very uh, uh, problem people eat, especially at the wrong times. They eat in the night when they shouldn't be eating. In the morning when they should be eating, they don't eat. And they, they, and, but they overeat at night. 
and then over sense gratification. Sense gratification in the sense that they, they, they will spend their time sleeping or uh, when they overeat then they will sleep more than they need to and they may have also uh, may become more passionate than they actually should be and they can't control their passion and this way they become a, a victim to illicit sexual relationships and over dependence on another's mercy depending on others many people depend on the government there are countries social welfare systems in countries like well in 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 america and canada and the U uk and in australia many parts of the world they have a, a welfare society and, and people can just depend on the government the government will provide for them and then also artificial standards of living could someone describe what would be a what some artificial standard of living can you think of some examples marriage having a luxury car because that is not needed but have a simple car so that is only for a part for transportation so people bought so many costly cars costly clothes which are not uh, as part of their necessity yes people all they they, they, have, they cannot walk anywhere they have to go by car huh? <laughs> so we, we, we become servant we become dependent on our vehicle to go anywhere so it's an artificial standard any other examples artificial standards of living as people are dependent on air conditioning and you know heat and central heat system and all other such luxuries yes That's right air conditioning and central heating over endeavoring for more money and spending all the time just for earning more money Oh yes, yeah, very good. Yes, sometimes people have, you know, one job in the daytime, and one job in the night also, and then they have another job on the weekend. So like three jobs, you know. <laughs> this this is something which happens. Uh, you know, it's, it it goes on quite a lot in many parts of the world. People think. Oh, yeah, sorry. Maharaj, also about the you know people living on pills instead of uh, you know organic food. You know they take a lot of medicines uh, instead of uh, you know a proper curated food that is good for their health. Oh and also yes, right, yes. They have somebody. There was one person. They said this pill. This is to stop my hair going grey. <laughs> They didn't want their hair to go grey, so they were taking a pill to stop the hair graying. And then another pill has to be taken for, for eating to help to digest. Another pill has to be taken to help sleep at night. <laughs> like this whole array of different uh, drugs which are used to maintain the body, to keep the body running. So artificial lifestyle, right. So that's all in the category of Alpa Ayusha. That means short life. And then Manda. Manda meaning slow, faulty, lazy. Manda, lazy. We were talking about lazy, you know, lazy habits. We have cars and everything. We, we, uh, we don't like to walk up the stairs, we'll have an elevator to take us up one floor, even you're just walking up one floor, you have to have a lift to take us up. And then for cooking, people don't like to cook, they will just go and purchase uh, ready-made food, uh, 
Well, in Japan, I've heard that in Japan, I don't visit Japan, but one devotee told me that in Japan, many people will take three meals a day in the 7-Eleven. They go to the 7-Eleven and the 7-Eleven will heat something up for them in some, you know, in some kind of uh, ultraviolet uh, cooker or something. And this way they have their meals. And so it's, it's so artificial, it's so lazy. People don't want to cook. They don't want to go shopping and cut vegetables and cook for themselves. Everything has to be just done for them. And fast food as well, sometimes fast food. Although here it says slow, slow, we're slow, slow in the sense we're slow to realize the problems of life. We're slow in seeing how conditioned we are. We're so conditioned and we're so victims of the Kali Yuga. And then Sumanda Matayo. Due to a bad system of education, men have no desire for self-realization. A bad system of education. The teachers, you could say, are actually at fault. It's not really the fault of the teacher, but it's the fault of the education system. The whole system of education is bad. And people are misguided. They think the goal of life is sense gratification. So as mentioned here, people have no desire for self-realization. They don't want to hear about controlling the senses. They don't, don't want to hear about a little tapashya. They just want to hear about economic development and sense gratification. So this is the miseducation of the Kali Yuga. So Sumanda Matayo. Even if they come to know about it, they unfortunately become victims of misguided teachers. So Prabhupada makes the point that even people want to get a little spiritual uh, realization, they're often tricked by some un unauthorized teachers misguided teachers. Just like here in Bengal, uh, here in Bengal there, there are many different Appa Sampradayas, there are many different bogus philosophies being propagated. And they have huge numbers of followers. They've, they've somehow they've established themselves, although it's so bogus and so misguided. But the people are victims so this is Kali Yuga. What is religion is known as irreligion. And what is irreligion? People think that is religion. Some more points. Mandabhagya. In this age there are victims not only of different political creeds and parties, but also of many different types of sense gratificatory divisions such as oneness, oh, such as cinemas, sports, gambling, clubs, mundane libraries, bad associations, smoking, drinking, cheating, pilfering, bickerings, and so on. So this is all mandapagya. Mm. Mm. And then upadrutaha, always disturbed full of anxiety. No wonder when we live in that kind of life, that kind of atmosphere, certainly people are not going to be peaceful. People are not going to be enjoying life very much. It's, it's going to be so much anxiety. The life's always going to be in danger, always threatened. So lazy, misguided, unlucky, and above all, always disturbed, mandabhagya, unlucky. You could, so people have a short life, they're lazy, they're misguided, they're unlucky, and above all, everyone is disturbed. 
So this is the state of affairs in the Kali Yuga. And thinking about, knowing about the nature of Kali Yuga, that's why the sages had all come to Naimasharanya to perform sacrifice for a thousand years. Because they knew they have to do something for the benefit of people. So then text number 11. Many varieties of scriptures, and in all of them there are many prescribed duties which can be learned only after many years of study in their various divisions. Many varieties of scriptures. There are, just like Puranas, there are 18 Puranas. Six Puranas for the mode of goodness, six for passion, six for mode of ignorance. All of them, there are prescribed duties, different duties, people in different varnas, ashrams, they have their different duties. And they can only be understood after many years of study. People need to study, they need to learn these things. Going back to text number 10, purport, it has become very difficult, therefore, to raise the spiritual standard due to the present distorted values of human society. The sages of Naimasharanya are anxious to disentangle all fallen souls, and here they are seeking the remedy from Srila Sutta Goswami. All right, so going back now to the first verse, which is the uh, opening verse of Srimad Bhagavatam. And it's one of your memorization verses. I should think most of you have already memorized it. It's a very famous verse. I Prabhupada liked us to know these different verses. They're very important in our preaching. So this first verse describes, this is actually the definition of the Absolute Truth. And uh, Srila Vyasadeva composed it for the benefit of all the devotees. So what we're going to do, how many people are in the class today? How many do we 28. have? 28. 28? All right. So we have... Uh, Including you, Maharaj. 20, 27. Okay. One, two, three, four. We have four. We're going to divide the first verse into four quotes. And we'd like each group to explain how Krishna is the absolute truth with reference to your quote, right? And you have to give references to give reference to the Sanskrit and the analogies and examples from the purport, and even you can give verses from Bhagavad Gita to support also. All right, uh, is it clear? Yeah. So we're going to give. We're going to divide the first verse into uh, four quote, four groups. Let's see, go back to the verse. All right. So the first group, group one, your verse will be very simple. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Right? So that's not very difficult for you. That's the first group. And then, group two, you will have the next line. Janmadhyasya yato navayad itaratas chattishyu abhigyana swarat. Right? So that's the, the line there after Om Namo Bhagavati Vasudevaya. And then group three, we will continue. Your line will be Tene Brahma Ridayadi Kavaye 
Muyanti Yat Suraya and Group 4 Tejo Varim Ridam Yata Vinimayo Yatra Trisagomrasha. Actually, we can have group five also. We can have five groups, not four groups. Right? We want five groups. So that will be five groups with at least five people, and some groups will have six people in. Right? And group five, you have the last line of this verse. Dam nasvena sada nirasta kuhakam sadyam param dimahi. So we want each group to analyze their particular uh, their particular quote and then explain how Krishna is the absolute truth from that quote. Is it clear? And we'll give you at uh, 10 minutes to work on this. Uh, Maharaj, this is the first exercise, so we yeah, will try our best to get it done. All right, thank you. See how, see how it goes, if you can finish in 10 minutes, very good. If you need more time, we can allow a few more minutes. Should we just, uh, divide the participants and break out room, or what would you prefer? Yes, you should divide and break out room. Yeah, that's the custom. That's the system. I request everyone to join the room as they are allotted to them. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Yes, Maharaj. So, which, what is our particular phrase here? What, what part of the sloka have we got to analyze? Uh, you have given uh, five parts. So, room one will do the first part, room two will do the second part. So, which, which group are we? So which group are we? What group are, is this? Uh, you also want to join any group? Yeah, I thought I was in the group, isn't it? This is a group, isn't it? Okay. Uh, I'm putting you in room one. That is group one. Okay.
Hare Krishna. That's one explanation, uh, Maharaj. Uh, the indication of the Krishna by using the word Vasudev and uh, the word Bhagavan. Uh, in, in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna himself uh, declared himself as a Bhagavan, uh, as a Supreme God. So, these two can explain uh, this first part. Yes, yes, good. And I have also in uh, Parpat, uh, Sula Prabhupada uh, quoted from Brahma Saita. So, Ishwara Parma Krishna Sachidananda Pikraha, Anagarati Govinda Sarvakaran Parana. So, Sula Prabhupada in, uh, in Parpat is quoting in the uh, Brahma Saita. So, this is all. As the first uh, part of oh no, Rodavash Chudavar, that, that means in Bhagavatam is pointing out the Supreme Person to Godhead, and that Supreme Person to Godhead is Krishna, in the son of Vasudhu. Yes. But we have to support it with some other evidence. Yeah, Bhagavad Gita, Brahma Shangita, Krishna, to Bhagavan Shah, Bhagavad Gita, other place, Shara Parama Krishna, Shachayan, the Vidra. One word from Bhagavatam is Ete Chamsa Kala Pumsaha, Krishna to Bhagavan Payam. So here again, Krishna is mentioned as Bhagavan. And Payam Bhagavan. This is not dependent on anybody else. Yes. Can you can you think of a verse from Bhagavad Gita which would be more appropriate no? Um Sarvasta Prabhu. Matta Sarvata Bata Tati Matta Bhantima Buddha Bhatsani Patmara. Okay. Yes. Mara there is one more was uh uh in which Lord says that uh, that uh, everything depends on me as the the, the pulse in a string. Yes, that's a good one. Atta paradaran nanat timsi desti dhananda mahi shadavadu atta shakti mani vanayi. Yes, it's a very powerful verse in this regard. Krishna said, Ahang bhuju pradapita. Father of everyone. Hmm. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Also, he said, Brahmana Ipudishta, I am the source of impersonal Brahma. Mr. Parsan is saying, Bhagavanam Jamara Mante, Nanavan Mam Prabhupada, Vasudevam Sarvamiti, Samahatma Sudurlava. This work can explain Vasudev as the um, mm -hmm. Yes, Krishna is certainly the Supreme Lord. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya, right? He's come as the son of Vasudev. Devaki and Vasudev. So the Lord is coming as Vasudev, the son of Vasudev. And he's Maharaj. coming, he is Bhagavan, oh, Bhaga, he's Bhagavan, he's, he's the Supreme Lord, hey? he's Bhagavan. So he's not just coming in an or, as an ordinary person. But he's coming as the Lord Himself. And he's a person, that's it's very personal as well. He has a name 
it's indicating a personality. It's not just simply some energy or some impersonal feature, but it's very personal that we are offering obeisances to this person who has come as the son of Vasudev. One of the verses also in Bhagavad Gita, uh, Lord says that uh, even uh, rishis and uh, demigods, they come from him. I forget the verse, it's I think in 7th or 8th chapter. Deva Rishi Naranam, I forget. So it clearly says no other. Om Adi Vidhivanan, Bhagavad Now may we do Shuragana. This will say. Of course, this mantra was also given to be, this was the mantra which was given by Narada Muni to Dhruva Maharaj so when he was to, going into the forest. He was reciting this mantra, and Srila Vyasadeva uses this mantra to begin Srimad Bhagavatam. So he begins the Srimad Bhagavatam in this way by, first of all, offering his obeisances to the son of Vasudeva, to the Supreme Personality of Godhead Vasudeva. So it's very significant that Srila Vyasadeva begins the Srimad Bhagavatam, 18,000 verses, and he begins it by first of all offering obeisances to the Personality of Godhead, Vasudev. So this is, it, it's clear that the Srimad Bhagavatam is going to be about Vasudev, about Lord Krishna. It's going to be the meditation, the glorification of Lord Krishna who has come into this world, he's come as the son of Vasudeva. Mm. So offering obeisances to the Lord in the very beginning indicates also that the Lord is a master, that he's above everyone, and we are all his servants. It indicates that the mood of devotional service, offering obeisances to the Lord. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, uh, he talks about, what is it, manmanabhava madbhakto madhyajimam namaskuru, right? Engage your mind in thinking of me, become my devotee, worship me and offer obeisances unto me. Then this way you will come to me without, I promise you this, because you're my de very dear devotee. So offering obeisances is mentioned there in Bhagavad Gita. And here we see Srimad Bhagavatam also beginning offering obeisances to the Supreme Personality of God. Are there any examples or analogies in the purport there in relation to this? It's a long purport, but can, can you pick out anything of relevance to this statement in, the, in Prabhupada's purport? Because it's a great help if we get something from the purport. Maharaj in Parpat, uh, Srila Prabhupada writes that uh, Krishna is always meditated upon by Paramahansa. So we have to such exalted uh, a personality, he is starting by meditating and offering obeisances. So this is indicate that Krishna is actually, so but, not only Shastra, but also the hints and the great personality also accept him as a Supreme Lord. Mm -hmm. 
Is there, is there any statements there where Prabhupada addresses this particular statement? In the purport, you know, where Prabhupada oh. particularly addresses the you know, offering obeisances to the personality of Godhead Vasudev. Does Prabhupada speak about this in the purport? Uh, Prabhupada says uh, Vasudev indicates the portions and plenary portions of the personality of Godhead. And uh, in the Vasudev also means the son of Devaki and Vasudev. So, so if we tie these two aspects together, it, 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 it becomes clear that uh, Sila Vasudev means Sri Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yes. Right. I think this, uh, this is uh, an important point. This is directly from Prabhupada's purport, right? Yes, 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 Maharaj. Yes, I think this is a, a good point. I think you have to present this. When, when we open, you should present this point. Yes. Yes, anything else? Any other points? I think we should be closing. I think who's in charge? <laughs> I think it's time to close the groups. I'll just find out what's going on. <laughs>